The story that we will be looking at today is a beautiful portrayal of the heart of God toward the rejected and the downcast. If you have ever experienced rejection, felt beaten down by life, felt taken for granted, felt used and abused, felt forgotten, felt helpless, and at the mercy of others more powerful than yourself, this story is for you. Let's turn over to Genesis chapter 16, Genesis chapter 16, as we continue our study through that book and the life of Abraham and those who cross paths with him. So Genesis chapter 16. Beginning in the first verse, it says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go in to my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. A little background. The Lord made a promise to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12 in the first three verses there that he would make Abraham into this great nation of people with many descendants. There's been a small problem with the promise that the Lord made to Abraham, though. Abraham and the woman that he's married to, Sarah, have not had any children. No children, no descendants, no descendants, no great nation, no great nation, failed promise. Well, after several years, God and Abraham, they have another conversation on this same topic in Genesis chapter 15, the first six verses there, and we looked at that last time. Abraham asked the Lord if one of his descendants should be his heir, since he didn't have any children yet. And this sounded like a reasonable plan. It was not uncommon in that day for a trusted servant to be adopted to become one's heir when there were no children. The Lord, though, made it very clear to Abraham, telling him that a son coming from his own body would be his heir. Well, more time has passed And still no children. And that brings us to where we are in Genesis chapter 16. Now to make sure that you understand what Sarah is proposing that Abraham do here, I'm going to reread these first two verses from the New Living Translation. It says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him, but she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarai said to Abraham, The Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. I want to begin by saying that not everything that you read in the Bible should be considered a good example to follow. (laughs) This is a case in point. We should, as a general practice, have children with our own wife or husband, not with the maid servant, not with the gardener, not with the milkman or anyone else. Now, believe it or not, this was actually an acceptable thing to do in that time and culture. Sarah is criticized by Bible readers for what she does here, but before we judge her too quickly, we should realize that her options are limited. Let's put ourselves in her shoes for a moment. They've been in Canaan 10 years now, and still they have no children. She and Abraham are both getting beyond the expected age for having children. Abraham is 85 years old. Sarah is 75 years old. Can I assume that most women here today would consider themselves beyond the age of having children at the age of 75? (laughs) There was tremendous pressure in that culture for a woman to provide her husband with a son to carry on the family name. Added to that was the promise that God had made to Abraham that he would have many descendants. So now you, as Abraham's wife, the one who would, under normal circumstances, bear these children, have been unable to get pregnant. From your perspective, you would feel like you're the one that's been standing in the way of the fulfillment of the Lord's promise and plan for your husband Abraham. In your mind, it's your fault that things have not worked out the way they're supposed to. You feel like 
you have to come up with a way for this promise to be fulfilled for your husband's sake, regardless of the cost to you personally. I can imagine that Sarah has laid awake at night for weeks and months and perhaps even years, thinking through her options. And the only solution that she can come up with, short of a miracle from God, was to give her maidservant to her husband as a surrogate mother, second-class wife, so that they can finally build a family. Well, as unbelievable as it might sound, the Lord actually wanted her and her husband Abraham to wait for the miracle. That happened to be God's plan for them. The Lord tells us in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. The Lord's power is given an opportunity to shine in our life when we have encountered the limits of our own strength and intellect. Remind yourself, the next time that you are in a situation beyond your strength and your intellect, that it's an opportunity for the Lord's power to shine in your life. Sarah and Abraham are in a situation that's far beyond their own ability to overcome. And the Lord wants them to wait and trust in him. That's not what they have chosen to do, though. It says at the end of verse 2, And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. In other words, Abraham agrees to go along with the plan that Sarah has come up with, making him as guilty as she for the train wreck that is developing. Remember back in chapter 15, Abraham asked if the Lord had intended for him to adopt one of his servants, namely Eleazar, as his heir, and the Lord told him, no, a son coming from your own body will be your heir. Now in chapter 16, Sarah suggests that they build a family through her maidservant Hagar. Well, this is really just a variation on the plan that Abraham had proposed a chapter earlier, isn't it? Should I adopt my servant? Should I use my servant? Now Sarah goes, well, let's not use your servant, but let's use my servant. God made it clear to them that he intended for a son to come from their own bodies, from the two of them. And as crazy and as unbelievable and impossible as that seemed to be in this moment, that is exactly what he intends to do and he's going to do. But they don't see how that's ever going to happen. So they decide to take things into their own hands and make something happen. Verse 3. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar and she conceived. So right off the bat, Hagar conceives. She's pregnant. So it appears that the problem on a biological side appears to have been Sarah rather than Abraham. Noting that helps us to understand the difference between Sarah's and Abraham's reaction to this whole situation. See, Sarah, she's understandably upset on a whole variety of levels, which we'll talk about more in a moment. Abraham, on the other hand, well, you know, he's feeling pretty good about how things are working out. I mean, he now has two women to enjoy his wives, and he is getting the child that he's always hoped for. Life is good for Abraham. I mean, this is a great plan, Sarah, that you came up with. Good going, girl. Or is it? Look at the second half of verse 4. And when she, Hagar, saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress, Sarai. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. Uh oh. Things are not so good after all. Now, as we put ourselves into the shoes of each of these three people, we can better understand why each of them reacts the way they do. Hagar, 
First off, it says that she looked with contempt on her mistress, or she began to despise her mistress, or to look down on her. See, Hagar has been the personal servant of Sarah's. Servants had no rights or privileges. She's accustomed to being told what to do and never asked her opinion about anything. I mean, she is a nobody. She's barely a human being. Hagar has suddenly been promoted now to the position of second-class wife, surrogate mother, and now she's pregnant with her master's only child. I mean, she's achieved something that her mistress Sarah has not been able to do. It's understandable that she would be tempted to feel a little more important than her place allowed and begin to see Sarah as inferior to herself. Sarah is upset for a number of different reasons. She's mad at herself for having come up with this plan that's now backfiring on her in ways that she had not anticipated. And in typical human fashion, she is blaming others now for what has happened, moving her responsibility onto the shoulders of others. She's hurt and she's mad at Hagar, which is not entirely justified, but understandable. Hagar had probably been one of Sarah's most trusted servants, who she feels is betraying her now. She had personally selected Hagar to be that woman to bear their children. This was certainly not the only servant that Abraham and Sarah had, but Hagar was chosen as the person to carry out this very special role in their family, Sarah trusted her. Now she feels betrayed by this person that she has allowed to come into that close inner circle of their family that only Sarah and Abraham had occupied before. She's hurt and she's mad at her husband Abraham. She doesn't feel like he's supporting her the way he ought to. That he seems to be kind of, you know, digging how everything's going instead of sharing her frustration. The text doesn't say it, but I would guess that Abraham is probably showing Hagar more attention now that's, than Sarah thinks he ought to. I mean, he had probably largely ignored Hagar before. Now that she's carrying this child of his dreams, he's doting over her. Oh, let, let me help you with that. Oh, you better sit down. Don't uh, overexert yourself. Sarah, can you get her a glass of water and another pillow? <laughs> Sarah's not happy. Abraham, it says in verse 6, he said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. So Abraham, he acts like he doesn't have a dog in his fight at all. He doesn't want to get in the middle of it. He tells Sarah to do, uh, do whatever you want with her. It's, you know, she's your servant. So he's getting what he wants, a child. Everything else is of minor consequence compared to that for Abraham. But once Abraham gives Sarah permission, she begins to mistreat Hagar. And I can almost hear Sarah thinking to herself, if this little Egyptian maid of mine thinks she's going to take my place in this family, she has another thing coming. I'm going to make her life a living nightmare. I will make it so bad for her that she will be forced to leave. And that's exactly what happens. It finally gets so bad that Hagar feels like her only recourse is to run away. She decides to go back to her homeland of Egypt. She's become the casualty in this train wreck that Sarah and Abraham have cooked up. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord found her, Hagar, by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? 
She said, I'm fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. So Hagar, she's on her way back to Egypt. She's out in the middle of that desert. And the Lord comes to Sarah, I mean to Hagar, out in the middle of this desert, and he begins to have a conversation with her. He, he asks her where she's come from and where she's going, even though he, he knows all about what's been happening back at home. This reveals in a beautiful way how the Lord's eyes are always on us. He looks out for the widow and the oppressed. Here when Hagar is blamed and abandoned by everyone, the Lord stands by her side and he comforts her. He's her advocate and her protector. The Lord sees us sitting out in the desert too, alone, frightened, confused, angry, about how life has been treating us. And he comes out in that desert where we are, and he engages us, too, in conversation. He asks us, where have you come from, and where are you going? He doesn't ask us these questions because he doesn't know the answer. He knows the answer to all that stuff. He asks us these questions to cause us to reflect. Where have you come from? Where are you going? Why are you here? Who are you trusting in? And the way we answer these questions is going to have an impact on how we see our whole life. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. So the Lord tells Hagar to return to your mistress and submit to her. Now, we don't expect that. We, we anticipate, especially in our modern way of seeing the world, we anticipate the Lord setting her free from Sarah to pursue a more self-fulfilling and happy life. That's not what happens. The Lord doesn't release her from her obligations. To Abraham and Sarah. She's part of that family and the Lord wants her to go back to it. But she won't be going back alone. The Lord will be with her. In our lives, there are situations that we can find ourselves in that we want to run away from. We want the Lord to take us out of that awful place and set us free from it. But running from the situation is not what the Lord wants from us. He wants us to live a Christ-honoring life in the midst of real life, no matter what kind of life that ends up being, with problems and circumstances that are very awful sometimes. You may be in the middle of a terrible situation that's pressing you beyond your limits. God may not take you out of that situation, but you won't be going through it alone. He'll be with you. The Lord does something else extraordinary and unexpected here, too. He blesses Hagar, and he gives her a promise similar to the promise that he gave to Abraham. He tells her that she will have many descendants, too numerous to count. Hagar is one of the few people in the Bible who are honored with a promise on this scale. And who is she? Is she some kind of super saint? No. She's not even an Israelite. She's a maidservant from Egypt, a virtual nobody. I love it when the Lord takes a person the world has cast off as useless And he rescues them, he blesses them, he gives them a promise, and he infuses their life with worth and glory that no one would have ever expected. He does that with Hagar. He does that with people all of the time. There are people in this room right now that he's done that with. People who were cast off as useless, who he has rescued. He's blessed. He's given them a promise. He's infused them with 
worth and glory that no one expected. Amen? Amen. You're one of them. Verse 11, And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she's told to name her son Ishmael. Ishmael means God hears. Think about that. Every time Hagar will call her son's name, she will be reminded of the truth that God hears, that he heard her. That God came to her aid, that he has blessed and honored her. When everyone else abandoned her, God came to her rescue. I think it's interesting to note that this name Ishmael, it, it has come over the centuries to mean outcast. For example, the famous opening words of the great American novel Moby Dick, they begin with, call me Ishmael. But outcast is not what the name Ishmael meant when the Lord gave it to this child. It meant God hears. God hears. One of the most precious truths that we can imagine, that the God who spoke this very universe into existence hears our cry. He cares about us. He comes to our rescue. God hears. Ishmael's future is spoken of here. It will not be an easy one. It says he'll be a stubborn man standing against the rest of the world. I wonder, is it a reflection of the kind of life that he will have living in this home? We'll see that they eventually get driven out of the family once more. Verse 13, it says, So she, Hagar, called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly, here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Bir Laai Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar, she gives a name to the Lord. You are a God of seeing or you are the God who sees me. It can be translated either way. People give names to other people, to animals, to places, to things, rarely to God. But she gives God a name. And what makes this even more interesting is that the Lord accepts the name that she gives him. He says, oh, don't call me that. My name is Yahweh, or my name, you know, he... What a great name it is, too, isn't it? You're a God of seeing. You are the God who sees me. She said, truly, here I've seen him who looks after me. Reminds me of something Jesus said in Matthew 10, 29. He said, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. There's that old song, his eye is on the sparrow, and his eye is on you. He watches over us. Hagar, this little sparrow, he comes and he rescues her. The well's name, Bir Lai Roy, it means well of the living one who sees me. Well of the living one who sees me. The Lord saw her suffering. He came and he met her in the desert of her life to let her know that he had seen her suffering, that he cared about her. 15. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore him Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. 
I want us to know that Hagar, she returns to the home of Abraham and Sarah, just like the Lord told her to do. And I'm struck by this woman's courage and her faith and her obedience to the Lord. I mean, when she gets back to the home of Abraham and Sarah, things haven't changed. The relationship between Sarah and Hagar is still difficult. Sarah still mistreats her. But it's what the Lord told Hagar to do, and she does it, trusting that the Lord will help her, give her the strength to live through it. The Lord doesn't always take the hard things out of our life. He wants to live a faithful life, trusting him, walking with him, whether there are hard things in our life or not. In fact, he uses the hard things, doesn't he, in our life to soften us, to knock off the sharp edges, to smooth out the rough spots, to make us beautiful and wise and kind. In closing, four things that I want to remind us of that we've seen in this story today. First is Sarah and Abraham's faith in God. It gets distracted by circumstances that appear to be getting in the way of the fulfillment of this promise that God made to them. They take on responsibility that's not theirs to fulfill God's plan in their life. They're going to make it happen. And what happens? A train wreck. That's what happens. They should have waited for God's miracle. God, he comes and he comforts Hagar, this young pregnant woman who has been blamed and abandoned by everyone, and he lets her see the one who sees her and looks after her. He blesses her with a promise that few others ever receive. And he lets her give him a name. You're the God who sees me. The Lord's the one who sees you too. He cares for us. He loves us. He knows about our suffering and our pain. We are never alone and beyond his caring, watchful eye. Hagar's courage and faith and obedience to the Lord. Returning to the home of Abraham and Sarah, even in the face of more bad stuff, waiting for her there. She's an example for us, isn't she, of Trusting the Lord even in the middle of hard things. Finally, even though it looks like Sarah and Abraham have made a complete mess of God's plan for them, his plan will still be fulfilled in spite of their failed efforts. He's going to give them a son of their own. It frustrates me sometimes when when I hear people say, oh, well, you know, God has his perfect plan, and then you made this decision, and now his plan is some second best thing for you. God is bigger than that. It doesn't work like that. His sovereignty overcomes all of that stuff. God's bigger than you and me. Take comfort in that. I mean, can you imagine how frightening and precarious it would be if it was really true that God has a perfect plan, you made a bad decision, and now, well, you know, your plan, God's plan for you is ruined. If that were the case, we are all living with ruined plans right now. You know that, right? Every single one of us, many times over, because we have all many times over ruined God's perfect plan for us. Every single one of us have. If that were the truth, we all ought to just jump off the cliff now. God's bigger than that. God loves you too much to let that be the way it works. God is still going to fulfill his promise to Abraham and Sarah. He's going to give them a son, just like he said he would. The name of that son will be Isaac, 
which means he laughs, referring to Abraham and Sarah's reaction to the birth of Isaac. They will both laugh at the unexpected goodness of the Lord to them. Every time they see their son Isaac, they'll be reminded how God unexpectedly blesses them with his goodness. Because their son's name is Laughter. Because God made them laugh. We can make some pretty big messes in our lives. But God, he has a way of taking our worst stuffing and turning it into good. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know how he does it. And we certainly don't want to go, well, that gives me license to just completely ruin my life and then see what God can do with that mess. Obviously not. I want you to see God's love, though. He loves you. The ultimate solution to our mess is Jesus, isn't it? So if you're thinking that your life is ruined because of something that you've done or something that someone else has done, I want to encourage you to Lay that before the Lord to trust him, to follow him. He's not left you. Your life is not ruined. Your life is not ruined. He's the God who sees you. And he can turn your tears of discouragement and regret and disappointment into belly laughs of joy over his unexpected goodness to you. Remember that. Psalm 33, 18. Psalmist wrote, Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. And indeed, he is the one we hope in, not in our own amazingly pathetic performance. Amen. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, I want to thank you for the story of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar. I mean, what great reminders are in this story for us of how good you are. Even in what we think are our best efforts at making things happen the way that we think they must have to be in order for things to work out the way you want them to work out and it ends up being a disaster. You continue to love us and you will continue to fulfill your good plan in our life. And oh, what a great reminder it is, Lord, that when we've been cast out and driven away like Hagar, that you come and rescue, that you see us, Lord. Your eye is on the sparrow and your eye is on us. Encourage your people this morning with that precious truth. In Jesus' name, amen.